Good morning. It is a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Rhonda Yantis as our guest speaker uh, for this morning. It is difficult to resume Dr. Yantis' rich career in only a few words, but I will try. Dr. Yantis received her medical degree from Harvard Medical School and did residency training in anatomy pathology at Massachusetts General Hospital, where she completed her first fellowship in surgical pathology, followed by gastrointestinal pathology fellowship at Beth Israel Deaconess. In 2005, she joined the academic ranks at Cornell Medical College, where she became full professor in 2013 and is currently the director of the gastrointestinal pathology service. Dr. Yantis won multiple awards for outstanding teacher, notably from the University of Massachusetts and Cornell University. In 2014, she was laureate of the Arthur Perdi Stout Prize for significant career achievements in surgical pathology. She is the current chair of the USCAP Education Committee and has published nearly 150 peer review articles as well as several books and book chapters. Dr. Yantis is a member of the editorial boards of several important journals, including Modern Pathology, the American Journal of Clinical Pathology, and the American Journal of Surgical Pathology. She is also an associate editor of the Archives of Pathology and Laborat Laboratory Medicine. Although her primary clinical and research focus is gastrointestinal and liver pathology, more recently, Dr. Yantis expanded her interest in de de determining the clinical pathology characteristics of COVID-19 infection in patients who died of disease. The results of that study were published last year, and her presentation today spans from that work. Please join welcoming Dr. Yantis to our grand rounds. Thanks very much, and thanks for the invitation. I'm sorry not to be there in person, but uh, it's great to see you guys all, uh, all the same. So now if I were sitting in my office looking at this title with this speaker, one of the questions I think that would come to mind for me is something like my frozen Scott, something like this. And that's a fair question. I'm certainly not an expert on COVID. In fact, I'm a straight AP person that hasn't signed out a lung biopsy or an autopsy in 15 years. And the reason why I chose this topic is really because I think that I and many other surgical pathologists throughout the pandemic have felt pretty sidelined and powerless. Our skill set hasn't exactly been in demand among our clinical colleagues who've been fighting COVID on the front lines or our CP colleagues who've been developing assays to uh, assess for infection. So the reason that I chose to talk about this topic is to, to arm us with knowledge, because I think when we have knowledge about the disease, we get back our power and we can try to start having normal lives. The other reason to talk about it is that even though I wasn't one of the movers and shakers in the COVID world, a lot of our colleagues actually were, and they've made really great contributions with respect to the tissue manifestations of COVID that have helped us understand what's going on and, and affected treatment. So this is really a shout out to them. Now, as you know, there are a handful of coronaviruses that affect humans. Most of them cause upper respiratory tract disease and the common cold, but three are associated with variably severe pneumonia. SARS-CoV, which is responsible for the epidemic in China about 20 years ago, MERS-CoV, which caused an epidemic in the Middle East about a decade later, and then the gift that just keeps on giving SARS-CoV, which we're dealing with COVID-2, which we're dealing with now. Now, SARS-CoV-2 first reared its ugly head in Wuhan, China in the late 2019, and really quickly went on to spread throughout the Huibei uh, province, such that in about four months, it had reached pandemic proportions. And at this point, we're dealing with more than uh, 3 million deaths worldwide, and a really high number of deaths with a lot of morbidity in the United States. The incubation period for disease is on the order of a week, plus or minus a few days, and the clinical course is variable, ranging from asymptomatic patients to those who are gravely ill. About 15% of patients have severe disease and about 5% have critical disease. But even those who are classified as having moderately severe disease 
will tell you it's the worst flu they've ever had. Patients typically present with uh, pulmonary symptoms with cough being the most common, as well as flu-like manifestations with fevers, myalgias, headache, and so forth. About 20% of people have gastrointestinal symptoms, usually in the usually nausea and vomiting or diarrhea, as well as GI bleeding. And then there are a few symptoms, anosmia and anesthesia, that uh, have been described in a minority of patients, but caught a lot of press early on. You know, it turns out that the risk for developing serious disease once infected is uh, is affected by multiple risk factors. Disease is far more uh, aggressive in the older age groups and in specific ethnic or racial groups, as well as individuals who have a variety of other risk factors related to chronic pulmonary and cardiovascular disease. In one autopsy study early on from Italy, the authors found that nearly half of patients who died of COVID in that study had at least three or more predisposing risk factors, and only three patients in the study had none of the risk factors on this list. Now, where did SARS-CoV-2 come from? Probably from, uh, from an animal source. There's a high degree of genetic homology with SARS-CoV-1 and a homology with some coronaviruses that infect horseshoe bats. There have also been reported similarities between SARS-CoV-2 and a coronavirus that, affects, that infects the Malaysian pangolin. And what's interesting is that the, rat, uh, the bat variants generally don't infect humans or pangolins, whereas the uh, pangolin viruses can potentially infect humans. So two hypotheses as to where the viruses come from have, uh, have, have emerged. One is that the, the uh, bat virus merged with some type of other coronavirus in a species other than the pangolin or a related bat virus moved to the pangolin and then ultimately to the human. And that would all be in the context of these wet markets where uh, people are buying and selling uh, live animals that are in close contact with humans. The virus itself is a positive sense single strand RNA virus that replicates mostly in epithelial cells, can also be detected in endothelial cells. It contains four major proteins and nucleo, uh, nucleo protein inside supporting the RNA, and then three uh, surface proteins, the most notable of which is spike protein. The spike protein is the one everyone talks about. It's the one that commercially available antibodies are directed against. It's the one that the in situ hybridization uh, assays are directed against. And it's what the vaccines are directed against. This is, the, uh, this is uh, a protein that's required for epithelial uh, cell entry. Uh, the pro protein is composed of two subunits, the S1 and the S2. The S1 subunit is the one that contains the receptor binding domain that actually opens up and binds to the ACE2 receptor. But the S2 uh, subunit isn't just hanging out in the breeze doing nothing. It's actually cleaved by a serine protease that's located on the cell surface. And that uh, protease facilitates membrane fusion between the virus and, uh, and the cells. So both ACE2 and TMPRSS2 are required for viral entry into the, epithe into the cells. ACE2 binds the uh, spike protein, and then it undergoes cleavage and fuses the virus to the cell membrane. Now, these spike proteins aren't just hanging off the virus floating in the breeze. They're actually heavily glycosylated, and that results and that's for a couple of reasons. Number one, the glycosylation essentially shields the uh, spike protein from the immune system, inhibiting immunity against it. And the glycosylation also holds that receptor binding domain in place, allowing for it to bind to the ACE2 receptor. So what it looks like is sort of the spaceship on Independence Day with Will Smith, the virus coming down with lots of spike proteins hanging off, docking to the combination of ACE2 and TMPRSS2. Now, one would think that the likelihood of the virus causing injury would be directly related to a cell to the extent 
to which a cell expresses uh, these two uh, uh, receptors. And in fact, we do see a greater degree of injury in epithelia that show high expression of both of those proteins. About uh, those sites include the trachea, the bronchi and mainstem airways, and uh, the lungs. Nearly half of autopsy patients will have tracheal ulcers and erythema that reflect uh, uh, erosions with inflammation or bronchial mucosal inflammation with exudates uh, reflecting that neutrophil rich uh, exudate uh, that's often present on the surfaces of those erosions. In the lung, uh, you see uh, one of three patterns of injury that can be seen in combination. Most commonly, the pattern of injury is diffuse alveolar damage, more than 90% of patients. And that can be either the exudative phase or the proliferative phase uh, of DAD. Often you'll see a heterogeneity of these patterns with a combination of acute lung injury and more of a subacute uh, process with hyaline membranes in combination with a fibroblastic proliferation in the interstitium and a type two pneumocyte hyperplasia. The target cell in the lung seems to be primarily the type two alveolar pneumocytes. This is in situ hybridization for the RNA of spike protein. And you can see that there are many cells that are uh, showing strong signal. You know, what happens is when the epithelial cells are infected, they rapidly die. So it's common that you'll see kind of cell shrapnel around those uh, epithelial cells reflecting uh, cellular necrosis. Now, it's also interesting that even though the entire lung or a section of the lung will look like varying degrees of diffuse alveolar damage, uh, the signal for uh, mRNA positivity or for RNA positivity is going to be, uh, is often localized. So much of the lung will, the lung will look uniform as far as the severity of injury, but the signal is limited to a small focus. So the virus causes rapid necrosis of type two pneumocytes upon infection, but there's a lot of injury going on in the uninfected epithelial cells suggesting that there is a lot of elaboration of cytokines and inflammatory mediators. So you'll have positivity in the area of uh, direct viral infection. And then at the periphery where there is no detectable virus, one can still see a lot of reactive uh, pneumocyte hyperplasia with binucleation and even some basophilic granules that were at first thought to possibly represent uh, some type of viral inclusion, they turn out to not be. You can see the same types of things in DAD for other reasons. Now, some patients, especially those that have prolonged uh, uh, disease courses and are on the ventilator for some time, will develop actual scarring in the lung. And occasionally, uh, uh, they'll have a lot of fibrosis in the lung that can, in fact, lead to transplant. Uh, sometimes all there will be is this burnt out uh, pattern of fibrosis, but in other cases, you'll, again, you'll see uh, temporal heterogeneity with fibrosis in some areas, hyaline membranes, and more of an exudative or proliferative phase elsewhere in the same lung tissue. So it seems like uh, some patients will go on to uh, a chronic phase of fibrosis or not. And some of the patients with fibrosis will still have evidence of active lung injury. The second pattern that we often see in these patients are, is a, a vascular injury with lots of uh, thrombosis. And you can either, you're gonna see uh, frequent wedge-shaped uh, pulmonary infarcts, or you might see large vessels that contain thrombi unaccompanied by uh, infarction of the lung parenchyma. So large vessel thrombi found in around 40 to, 40 to 50% of autopsy cases, small vessel microthrombi are actually much more common. And these can be composed mostly of fibrin, mostly of platelets expressing CD61 or both. And the idea is that these small vessel uh, thrombi basically increase the resistance to flow across the capillary beds and uh, uh, promote hypoxia. Now, the third pattern of injury has not been uh, extensively described in the literature, and it's an interstitial pattern of 
fibrin hemorrhage with fibrin and neutrophilic inflammation in uh, the uh, 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 septal walls. Now it's true that uh, patients who have uh, COVID-19 can certainly get superimposed separative pneumonias. Uh, there's nothing protective about COVID and these are hospitalized patients at risk for a, additional acquired infections. But the pattern of inflammation is really not that of a typical pneumonia. And, uh, and it does feature all of this fibrin and hemorrhage in combination with the inflammation. Now in the GI tract, if we see hemorrhage, fibrin and neutrophilic debris, in small capillaries, the top 10 things that we think about are uh, microvascular injury, uh, uh, almost like a leukocytoplastic vasculitis type of, of, of process. And I think that some of the evidence at least suggests that that same type of microvascular injury may be going on in a subset of patients with uh, severe COVID-19. So uh, this phenomenon has been termed lots of different things in the literature, but one term that Dr. Borzik in our department has uh, glommed onto is the neutrophil extracellular trap. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. It's something that was described after many of us completed medical school. And what these are, are three-dimensional lattice-like structures that are elaborated by dying neutrophils. Uh, they're part of the innate immune system. And what they represent is essentially decondensed chromatin that is spewed out of a dying cell and it contains embedded histones and antimicrobial uh, proteins, almost like a fishnet with a bunch of, uh, of uh, uh, grappling hooks stuck to it and poison bottles to uh, kill pathogens that might be circulating. So these ne uh, neutrophil extracellular traps or nets are produced and released by uh, neutrophils through a tightly regulated process of cell death. They're not specific to COVID. You can certainly see them in patients who have sepsis or, or other diseases, but they're, they're very common in, uh, or numerous in patients with COVID who actually have them. What happens is there's citrullination uh, and histone modification that uh, during this process that essentially opens the chromatin up to promote transcription of genes involved in inflammatory pathways, like uh, in some patients with rheumatoid arthritis, this is a, a major pathway of inflammation. And it can also uh, obviously uh, results in uh, death of the cell. So diagrammatically, it looks something like this. You have these activated neutrophils that are on the way out the door. And as they die, they express their chromatin contents into the small, vas small vessels. Those nets are uh, studded with proteins and uh, platelet factor four that all activate circulating platelets and other inflammatory cells, overall increasing the inflammatory microenvironment. Now, if you look at COVID lungs uh, or patients who die of COVID compared to the normal lung, you can see that they actually have a lot of these nets compared to normal. So these immunofluorescence studies show uh, neutrophils uh, staining red with uh, myeloperoxidase and these early nets with the uh, altered histones are uh, somewhat green. If we compare the normal lung to uh, that of a COVID patient who dies of respiratory illness, there are a few scattered neutrophils in the normal lung, but increased neutrophils overall in the COVID patients, as well as high numbers of these altered neutrophils. And if you look at the thrombi in the microvasculature of the COVID patients, you can appreciate that there are a lot of these net forming neutrophils. In fact, if you look at pulmonary function compared to the number of these nets detected in the lung, and this is obviously autopsy uh, material, so nobody did well. But what you can see is that the higher the number of nets, the poorer the overall pulmonary function of the patient. And these are also associated with shortened survival overall. So from a lung standpoint, there seem to be at least three things, three different things going on. Diffuse alveolar damage that is histologically identical to DAD due to other causes, although it can be, or tends to be more temporally heterogeneous. Uh, heterogeneous thrombi 
can also see those in other diseases, not specific for COVID, but they tend to be more numerous in the small vasculature as well as the large vessels. And they tend to be more common in COVID related DAD than to DAD uh, due to other causes. And then we have this funny neutrophil rich, rich interstitial pattern that may represent this uh, tendency to stimulate the innate system, uh, immune system and cause uh, coagulopathies, thereby identifying a subset of patients who have really severe disease. Now, if you look at the uh, distribution of ACE2 across human tissues, no surprise that we see a lot of it in the lung, but you actually see more ACE2 in the GI tract, particularly the small bowel and the colon. And if you look at the uh, extent to which different tissues co-express ACE2 and TMPRSS2, there's really a lot of co-expression in the GI tract, in the, uh, uh, particularly in the intestines. We're not gonna talk about uh, the gallbladder today. It turns out that about 20% of patients with COVID-19 who ha uh, have symptomatic GI manifestations, abdominal pain, diarrhea, or bleeding, and most notably severe diarrheal illness and uh, lower GI bleeding. The incidence overall of diarrhea hovers around uh, between uh, eight and 10%. But if you look at pooled data from a number of studies, what's interesting is that there doesn't really seem to be a correlation between the severity of pulmonary symptoms and the presence or absence of GI symptoms. So they seem to be unrelated. Uh, there really isn't much in the literature about the GI manifestations of COVID-19, and there are pretty good reasons why that is the case. Really from March forward for the first six months, our institution and many others essentially suspended all elective procedures that were done in the outpatient setting, and we avoided procedures on hospitalized patients unless the patient's life was at risk. So we have very little endoscopic material on these patients. Most of what's been studied thus far has been autopsy material. For those of you who do autopsies, it's not a great place to look at the GI tract. And then we also have resection specimens, most of which are obtained for uncontrolled bleeding and ischemia. So a bunch of dead bowel resections that show transmural necrosis, lots of ulcers and fibrin thrombi as well as autopsy material that is often poorly preserved. So what I wanna do in this part of the talk is uh, get into more familiar territory for myself and, uh, and talk a little bit about the GI manifestations or what we know about them as far as pathology goes. So this was a case that we received in early April of 2020, right at the peak of the pandemic in New York City. 71 year old male presented with lower GI bleeding uh, at the uh, splenic flexure. He was found to be SARS-CoV-2 positive, but he had a stable respiratory status on a nasal cannula. He, did not, uh, he didn't get intubated. See, he underwent CT angiography that revealed extravasation at the splenic flexure. He was sent for an embolization procedure, but they couldn't identify the actual bleeding site. And because he was hemodynamically unstable, he underwent a hemicolectomy. The resection, the resection specimen was remarkable for not being very remarkable. Certainly doesn't look like an ischemic bowel. We do have a few areas of, that might represent hemorrhages and lots of sections through those areas revealed scattered uh, ectatic funny shaped uh, veins surrounded by hemorrhage with these little uh, lateral herniations and irregularities in the wall. So probably some angiodysplasia certainly not something that was related to COVID. What was interesting was what the background mucosa in this resection specimen actually looked like. Diffusely, the epithelium looked really weird. There was no increase in lamina propria inflammation. There was no intraepithelial inflammation, and there were no crypt architectural abnormalities or crypt loss, but the epithelium looks really funny. Looking at this random section, but the entire colon looked like this, we can appreciate that the superficial crypts have a little bit of a convoluted or serrated appearance. And that's because many of the surface and superficial crypt epithelial cells 
have these funny cytoplasmic blebs. And at the luminal surface, they're actually aggregates of epithelial cells, not detaching from the uh, basement membrane, but piling up on each other, creating these little micropapillary tufts. What we notice is that there's not much a nuclear disarray or apoptosis and no intraepithelial inflammation to explain that. A little bit of degeneration perhaps here, but sort of disproportionate when you think about the entire colonic epithelium having this funny uh, appearance with these cytoplasmic blebs. Now you might say, well, this is just some funny change. It's probably nothing. But if we look at what the normal colon in this site is supposed to look like, we can appreciate that there's a marked decrease in the number of goblet cells compared to what should be expected. And we certainly don't have this ruffled, unusual quasi serrated look uh, in, the, in the normal colon. So looks a little bit odd. If anything, it kind of reminds you of that papillary tufty type change you sometimes see in colonic biopsies from bone marrow transplant patients who have adenovirus. So since this was at the front end of the pandemic and we had the antibodies and in situ hybridization, we looked at them. And uh, I'll tell you that other viral stains were also done. They were all negative. The spike protein immunohistochemistry does show some staining at, in those cytoplasmic blebby areas, not staining of goblet cells. The goblet cells are over here. These are those apical snouts that we could see histologically. And that correlates also with the in situ hybridization for spike protein RNA. And we, because it was a resection specimen, we were able to go back and post fix the, uh, the colon and submit for EM. And I think I can, I hope that I can convince you that there are these unusual spiky structures in between the uh, epithelial cell protrusions and also at the surface here that in combination with the in situ hybridization and the immunohistochemistry probably represent viral particles. So what we were thinking was that the uh, epithelium of the gut can in fact be infected by the uh, virus, that the viral uh, cytopathic changes, if you will, don't actually cause much in the way of cell injury, transient. The patient was actually asymptomatic from a dial real standpoint, so it may not even cause any GI symptoms. And because the changes were so extensive, it almost required that there be a lot of cell to cell transmission rather than something like a luminal uh, load or direct invasion from the vasculature. So a few months later, a, a paper came out in science that pretty much supported those kinds of ideas. What these authors did was they used immunofluorescence to look at intestinal organoids that were infected with SARS-CoV-2. -CoV and these, infection, these uh, organoids are kind of the reverse of uh, the normal microanatomy. So the luminal aspect is actually right here. This is the uh, uh, terminal web of the brush border. So what they did was they single cell injected the virus and then they imaged the uh, organoids over time. And what you can see is that after about 60 hours, the entire organoid is infected. But you'll also notice that even though this is a, a funny stain to look at, there's not much in the way of epithelial cell disarray or dropout. So it's not clear that the infection, which we know is clearly there, is actually causing cell injury. The authors also looked at EM on their organoids. And as is common in the science, science type papers, they put a lot of panels. I'll just draw your attention to a couple of them. One, the immature viral particles are thought to be these double membrane bound vesicles. And two, you can see the Golgi that contains viral particles uh, uh, here and also the same types of things at the luminal surface, very similar to what we were seeing. So we, we think that we really do have images of, of the uh, ultra structural features of the virus. I bring that up because there are a lot of papers out in the, pub, in the literature where it's not entirely clear that the structures that are thought to be uh, the virus actually are. Now, it is clear from the clinical literature that SARS-CoV-2 can infect the GI tract. 
These are pooled data from over 5,000 patients in whom viral detection was at, or the viral detection was attempted in various secretions. And what you can see is that you can identify the viral, viral RNA in stool uh, at a pretty much the same time interval that you start to see it in the upper uh, respiratory tract and, and in the blood. But the uh, virus can be shed from the GI tract for a much longer period of time. And if you look at pooled data from studies that specifically looked at stool analyses, you can see that overall about half of patients who have SARS-CoV-2 have uh, uh, detectable viral particles in the stool and that, that uh, those positive assays persist long after uh, the respiratory sampling turns negative. And it can be as long as a month afterwards that you still have negative stool or positive stool assays. What's important is that there are also uh, about a third of cases in which you can uh, retrieve viable organisms from the stool, suggesting that maybe fecal oral transmission may play a minor role in the spread of the virus. So what we know so far, based on all of the data, is that SARS-CoV-2 can directly infect enterocytes and probably spreads from one infected cell to an adjacent uh, next door cell. Infection can cause visible epithelial cell alterations, but in the gut, at least, it doesn't cause that extensive epithelial cell necrosis that we tend to associate with viral infection of uh, pneumocytes. The viral burden in the GI tract seems to be unrelated to clinical findings. I'll tell you, we looked for a lot of virus in a lot of GI samples over the past year. And this is the only case a patient who has no GI symptoms to, uh, to uh, attribute to the virus. This is the only case in which we actually identified it. So there's no relationship between the detection of GI infection and the the presence of GI symptoms and no relationship between the presence of an extent of GI symptoms and the severity of respiratory compromise. But we do know that there is shedding of the virus from the GI tract and that it can persist for a long time after the pulmonary symptoms, possibly representing a mode of spread. Now, a few days after this case, we had another case of a 35-year-old guy who'd had a remote renal transplant was admitted with C. diff colitis. At the time of admission, he was negative for SARS-CoV-2, but on hospital day four, he had a positive swab. He didn't have any res respiratory symptoms, so but he did undergo a radiographic imaging because of the positive swab, and radiographically, he had bilateral infiltrates consistent with pneumonia. He was discharged on day five. Uh, his, his diarrheal symptoms completely resolved. And then more than two weeks later, he was readmitted with GI bleeding that was severe enough to require a transfusion and he underwent endoscopy. Notably on this admission, he had two PCR assays for SARS-CoV-2 and both of them were negative. What's striking about the upper endoscopic findings is that we have this very patchy uh, hemorrhagic appearance to the mucosa with indurated areas uh, of modeling discoloration over the folds, but the background mucosa is totally normal. So it's not the typical ischemic enteritis pattern. It looks more like there's actually bleeding into the mucosa and the submucosa. And that's what it looked like under the microscope. The biopsies from this area showed an uninflamed uh, mucosa with normal villus architecture, as we can see here, and patchy mucosal hemorrhage patchy hemorrhage even within a single tissue fragment. So over here, we have some hemorrhage and fibrin. Over here, same thing, but the intervening mucosa shows normal villus architecture, normal epithelium, so it's not sloughing off like an early ischemic type change, and lots of epithelial cell regeneration in the deeper crypts. Closer examination, again, normal in, uh, villus architecture, normal appearing uh, in pterocytes, lots of regeneration and hemorrhage with some strands of fibrin in the lamina propria. Now, when you see this pattern of patchy mucosal hemorrhage with fibrin, you wanna look around and see if that's associated with polys because this is a typical pattern for what microvascular injury in the small bowel actually looks like. And sure enough, when we go to other areas, we can see those tiny 
uh, punctate hemorrhages associated with some fibrin and even some thrombi. And a CD61 immunostain for platelets actually stained a few of those thr uh, thrombi as well. What's interesting was that the, uh, the CoV2, SARS-CoV-2 IHC and in situ hybridization were both negative in this case. Now it's well known that patients who have SARS-CoV-2 are hypercoagulable. In early data, we, uh, we and others showed that uh, these patients often have uh, a DIC type picture, although they have really, really markedly elevated D-dimer levels and modest uh, alterations in other uh, factors. In autopsy studies, we and others have described fibrin thrombi in the large vessels of the lung, in the small vessels of the lung, and the vasculature outside the lung. So you can see these little micro thrombi in the prostatic veins, in the kidney, in the heart, lots of different places in over 80% of autopsy patients. Now, how is this happening? Well, there are two possible mechanisms. One would be that you have direct endothelial cell damage by the virus, or two, that viral infection causes some cascade of events that affects the systemic circulation. The evidence for direct endothelial cell infection is best in the lung. And to my knowledge, really the best uh, convincing data that it, the endothelium is actually infected has come from the lung. We haven't been able to identify viral particles in extra pulmonary vasculature. So uh, <clears throat> we do know that endothelium expresses ACE2, and we know that infection of endothelial cells can cause injury. So this is a nice uh, electron micrograph of an endothelial cell in the lung showing the, uh, a nice uh, viral particle right here. Indirect uh, changes are more likely to account for the microvascular injury that we see outside the site of primary infection. And this could be due to either sustained complement activation or dysregulation of those neutrophil extracellular traps and immunothrombosis. There are some different lines of data to suggest that there's micro dis microvascular dysfunction systemically in patients who have COVID-19. These are data from a study that looked at the uh, flow characteristics through small vessels in the sublingual uh, location, patients with moderate to severe COVID-19 compared to uh, healthy controls. And basically what they showed was that there's a decreased red cell velocity and a lack of intact endothelial cells in the vessels of COVID patients significantly more so than in healthy controls, suggesting that this reduced capillary perfusion is a corollary of microthrombosis or at least endothelial uh, injury, possibly with activation of complement. In another study uh, put out by Cynthia Magro in our department, the authors looked at uh, characteristics of microthrombi in the lung versus those that we see at autopsy uh, in lots of other tissues. And what they did was they looked at ish for spike protein, so actual detection of the virus, immunostains for viral proteins that could detect viral, intact virus or protein fragments, and then uh, complement factors. And what they found was that in the pulmonary capillaries, where you see the damage to the, the small vessels with thrombosis, you can detect uh, uh, viral particles by in situ hybridization, you can also detect viral proteins by immunohistochemistry and there's complement activation. But in the small vessels of other sites where you see the same type of endothelial cell necrosis and thrombosis, you'll detect viral particles by, in situ, by immunohistochemistry and complement, but the ish is actually negative. So you don't detect a viral intact virus at those sites. So what they proposed might be happening, which is kind of a cool idea, is that in the lung there, where you have the primary infection and lots of virus around, the endothelial cells get, uh, get infected and they get turned on to interact with macrophages and other inflammatory cell types to elaborate lots of cytokines, ultimately culminating in the death of those infected endothelial cells. When those cells lyse, they 
spew out their contents into the circulation. Some of those contents are intact viral particles, but a lot of it is actually fragmented viral protein. When those hit the circulation, the fragmented spike protein can still bind to the ACE2 receptor and binding here can turn on this same inflammatory process. So their idea is that uh, infection site, it, infection in the lung results in the elaboration of lots of decoy proteins that go out into the circulation and stimulate the inflammatory cascades in a similar way to the primary virus. Now, uh, going back to the neuro, neutrophilic extracellular traps, it turns out that those can be detected not only in the lung, but also in other organs and in the circulation. And uh, what might be happening in COVID patients is that out in the circulation, there's dysregulation of this process and elaboration of more cytokines leading to extensive microvessel or microvessel thrombi in lots of different organs. And it may in fact be that the tissue damage that these, that these very sick patients develop could be in part due to these uh, microthrombi. If you look at the plasma levels of uh, these uh, nets in healthy donors versus COVID patients, they're significantly higher in the COVID patients. And, uh, and that persists whether they're the intubated uh, folks or the non-intubated folks. So it's not, the nets aren't res resulting from mechanical ventilation, they seem to be related to uh, infection itself and they go down during the convalescent period. So there are at least two mechanisms that could explain the virus mediated co uh, coagulopathy. Viral infection in the lung leads to release, release of these decoy proteins causing systemic microvascular in injury or amplifying feedback loops that involve the innate immune system with neutrophils, nets, and platelets that cause uh, uh, cascading events of platelet activation and release and elaboration of uh, cytokines to in turn create more of these nets and more elaboration of PF4 and other uh, inflammatory mediators. So the idea is that this process propagates thrombi in the vasculature leading to multi-organ failure through tissue injury. And importantly, this hypercoagulated coagulable state can persist after the virus is no longer detected because it's really the result of viral activation and a self-sustaining cycle of uh, inflammation and coagulopathy. Now, the last case I wanna talk about is that of an 88 year old male who uh, presented with hypertension, who had a history of hypertension and COVID-19. He was initially managed as an outpatient but then was admitted for worsening shortness of breath about 10 days after, or not about uh, 10 days after COVID-2 detection. Two days later, two days after he would, was admitted, he developed profound diarrheal symptoms. And by that, I mean really profound, more than five liters of diarrhea per day, despite multiple attempts to, man to medically manage it. He consistently had negative stool studies for virtually every pathogen, and, uh, and he was also never super sick from a respiratory standpoint. He was stable uh, in that regard on nasal cannula. The endoscopic findings were pretty underwhelming, that one could argue that the mucosa was a little bit congested in the proximal small bowel. Maybe there was some decreased uh, vascular patter pattern and maybe some flattening of the mucosa, but pretty soft calls from an endoscopic standpoint. But the biopsies looked really bizarre. What we noticed right off the bat is number one, there's no inflammation or no increased inflammation. Number two, the villi are pretty much preserved, although much of the mucosal thickness is now composed of crypt hyperplasia. And number three, this surface epithelium and even the crypt epithelium is really regenerative looking. So there's an attenuated lining on the surface, attenuated cells with increased mitotic activity in the crypt region, no inflammation really to explain that. There's no intraepithelial mononuclear cell rich infiltrates or neutrophils. And the jejunum pretty much looks the same. 
The villa's architecture is a little bit remodeled with some crypt hyperplasia, but we don't see inflammation in the surface epithelium. What we do see is uh, a lot of epithelial injury. So there's marked mucosal remodeling with injury to the epithelium. You know, looking at that, that the brush border is not working right. So it's not a surprise that he has diarrhea, but the pattern is really unusual for most biopsies that we encounter. In fact, there's so much regeneration that you could actually see endocrine cells on the surfaces of the mucosa rather than being simply confined to the deeper crypt region. The ileum was similar, a little bit of edematous, maybe congested, but the biopsies basically again showed no increase in inflammation, marked attenuation of the surface lining cells over the tips of the villi, as you can see here. And again, endocrine cells that have left the proliferative compartment because the proliferative compartment is now on the surface of the mucosa. So lots of uh, epithelial regeneration with no explanation as to why that's happening. In the colon, we also saw a lot of epithelial regeneration, some sloughing of epithelial cells into the cryptolumina, no inflammation really to explain these changes. Uh, no intraepithelial uh, inflammation, lots of attenuated lining and necrotic uh, sloughing cells in the lumina of uh, many of the crypts. The C. diff, by the way, was negative on multiple attempts. And uh, in the right colon, predominantly, there was this marked epithelial regeneration with cytoplasmic depletion, nuclear enlargement, and a little bit of disarray but not much apoptosis in the intact epithelium. So many medication related injuries, what you'll see is neutrophilic debris in the crypts, a little bit of it, but most of the debris is going to be in the intact, uh, in the intact epithelium along the crypt. You'll see like these little popcorn cells or shriveled up looking nuclei. That's not really what we have in this, in this case. We expected to see a rip roaring positive uh, in situ hybridization for SARS-CoV-2. And we're really surprised that all of the biopsies were negative and we didn't identify any uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, positive staining with the immunohistochemical stain either. So we have a severe pan enterocolic injury to the mucosa despite a, despite a complete lack of substantial inflammation. The patient was not immunosuppressed, not bone marrow transplant, nothing like that. And on no medications known to cause diarrhea. Been on a long-term PPI and a probiotic and low dose mesalamine for a presumed diagnosis of Crohn's disease that was never confirmed. These biopsies don't look anything like Crohn's disease. And he had started on uh, 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 one of the uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, for a few days prior to the onset of diarrhea, but that was stopped before he came to the hospital. So he had no detectable viruses, no medications to explain, no detectable viruses, no detectable pathogens, and no medications to explain what was going on in the GI tract. So just a couple of comments on ACE2. This is both an enzyme and a receptor. In, it normally hydrolyzes angiotensin II to angiotensin, effectively counteracting the uh, pro-inflammatory effects of, uh, of the uh, renin angiotensin axis by decreasing the substrate for ACE. So diagrammatically, if you look at the situation in which you have uh, local or systemic infection or sepsis, angiotensin one is converted to angiotensin two that binds to its receptor, promoting lung injury, myocardial remodeling, vasoconstriction, and permeability. What ACE2 normally does is offloads these substrates by converting them to angiotensins. Now, when SARS-CoV infects <clears throat> the, uh, the cell, it not only competitively inhibits binding of ACE2, but it also downregulates ACE2 expression. So the net effect of viral infection is decreased ACE2 action, resulting in unopposed activation of this axis, overall increasing inflammation. ACE2 does a lot of other things in the GI tract. It's co-expressed with amino acid transporters to facilitate uh, their, their transport, particularly 
tryptophan absorption. It regulates the mTOR pathway and uh, the function of PANA cells controlling antimicrobial peptide release and altering or regulating the microbiota. So decreasing ACE2 in the setting of SARS-CoV-2 presumably alters the, the microbiome and promotes mucosal inflammation. Now, we talk a lot in the setting of COVID about the cytokine storm and the cytokine release sy uh, syndrome. This is a life-threatening systemic inflammatory condition that basically reflects the uncontrolled elaboration of all of these cytokines that, that in turn result in immune cell hyperactivation. So it involves IL-6 as well, as well as a lot of other mediators, neutrophils, neutrophilic extracellular traps, macrophages, and other cells, as well as T cells. Now there's nothing specific about the cytokine storm as it relates to COVID. People who are septic or infected with other things can certainly develop this, this manifestation, but it's common in patients who have COVID and they are at risk for developing multi-organ uh, failure or dysfunction. Clinical manifestations of the storm, high fever, respiratory distress, distress, coagulopathies, low platelets, many of the things that we do see in really sick COVID patients. It turns out that the likelihood of developing this phenomenon may be related to underlying genetic predispositions. We know from experience with the H1N1 uh, infection that patients who died and got super sick with uh, the hemophagocytic lymphohistias or, or got sick with that infection had underlying mutations that predisposed them to hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, uh, such as alterations in these genes. The treatment of the cytokine storm is corticosteroid therapy, which at the front end of the pandemic, we were hesitant to give patients. In retrospect, there is some clinical evidence that that was going, what was going on in part in this patient. As I mentioned earlier, the patient was tried on a lot of different medications to control his diarrhea. And uh, if we plot stool output by bowel movements, the rectal tube was here. So we're looking at a blow up over here. There were two places in the overall scheme of things where the amount of diarrhea decreased. One was right at the time right shortly after the patient was given intravenous corticosteroids and the, uh, the diarrheal output dropped by a liter per day. And the second time in which there was a drop was following initiation of budesonide therapy. So even though we didn't realize it at the time, probably this patient uh, uh, was responding to this immunosuppressive therapy. So there are a lot of reasons why patients with COVID-19 might develop diarrhea, downregulation of ACE2 mediated anti-inflammatory effects, alterations in amino acid homeostasis through the effects on tryptophan, which is important for gut health, alterations in the microbiome, and of course the pro-inflammatory effects of the virus itself that uh, lead to this uh, cytokine storm. So in summary, SARS-CoV-2 infection can cause a variety of changes in the GI tract. Infection of the epithelium seems to induce changes in cell morphology, but they don't necessarily correlate with symptoms, and they're probably transient. Coagulopathy can persist for weeks following infection. This is probably what accounts for the uh, high numbers of ischemic uh, of cases of ischemic enteritis in these patients. This could be due to uh, positive feedback loops involving neutrophils, platelets, and complement. The microvascular injury is pro-inflammatory with lots of complement activation, and that also contributes to this exuberant cytokine release. The diarrheal symptoms uh, likely result from the combined effects of dysbiosis in uh, combination with the sustained pro-inflammatory state of the virus. But what all of this means is that when we are on the front lines as the pathologist trying to figure out what's going on with these very sick patients, it's really important for us to try to interpret the histologic findings in the clinical context of, uh, of uh, what's happening currently in order to better understand the pathogenesis of this really complicated, complicated and uh, devastating disease.
So with that, I will close and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Yantis. Um, any questions? Knowing full well that I am not a pulmonary person. <laughs> That's my caveat. <laughs> well, actually, I have a, I'm going ahead with a question, and this is not for, for the lung. Um, oh, okay. So, yeah, I was, I was wondering, what is the impact of COVID infection on patients who already have chronic inflammatory disease? You mentioned that for one of the last patients that you presented, that he had a disputable, you know, remote diagnosis of Crohn's, like, um, but I was wondering in general, patients with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. What would yeah. be the impact? So uh, th there's not, that's a great question. So for this patient, I think he probably didn't have Crohn's because when you got down to it, he kind of took his drugs, uh, misalamine, which is like not a, not a high power drug anyway. Uh, he took them when he felt like it. If he forgot about it, he didn't worry about it. And it was something that he'd been doing for, it was just part of his routine. Uh, so, so and he didn't really have diarrheal symptoms in episodic diarrheal symptoms or anything to suggest that he did have Crohn's prior to this whole uh, hospitalization. So, so I think he probably is one of those patients that got labeled that way and then carried the diagnosis. Certainly there was nothing in any of his biopsies or imaging to suggest he had a chronic inflammatory bowel disease. But in getting to your question, there are some data coming out that patients who have underlying IBD and, uh, and get COVID may have colitic flares, whether it's COVID in the GI tract or COVID causing coagulopathies in these patients, it's not, it's not entirely clear because we're not getting biopsies on them. They're all clinical management cases. Um, the, as far as I know, there's not anything in the literature about severity of COVID in patients who have HIV though. So uh, the way the disease interacts with other diseases, I think is, is a question that remains to be answered. Okay, and I have a question that was submitted on chat. Is oh, there, Is there ACE2 and TMPRSS2 expression in bats and other non-human hosts, or is there a different entry me mechanism? Oh, that's a great question. And I don't know the answer, but I would suspect that it's the ACE2 that they enter the cells through the same way because the, that spike protein sequence is conserved across many species. Dr. Ferrieri. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. In the SARS one, uh, it, was a, it was a stretch for me, I have to say. <laughs> well, I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, I want to lead off by mentioning SARS-1, SARS-CoV-1 in 2003, where GI transmission was proposed based on uh, spread within a hotel with faulty plumbing. My question for you is whether you're aware of GI biopsy findings in patients from that era with SARS-CoV-1 or any ultra-structural findings as well that might compare to what you have shown us today? That's also a great question. Um, so I'm not, um, and I'm not sure that SARS-CoV-1, uh, I'm not sure people were actually tuned into it, to be honest with you at the time. I, I think that the pandemic really shook people to be awake and try to find answers. And it wasn't something that we were questioning. Like I, I was at the University of Massachusetts when SARS-CoV-1 was happening and it just didn't seem to be like that, that Western doctors were really on it. I, I don't, I would be curious to know what other people people were thinking or think of that time period. But my recollection, I, I was junior, but my recollection is that it really wasn't on our radar. I would agree with you. And the mortality rate was very low. At, I don't know, 3% or a little more than that. So it wasn't as compelling here. Yeah. Yes, sir. Dr. Croson. 
Uh, thank you very much. That was a fascinating talk. And I was wondering if you know anything about the expression of ACE2 receptor on different endothelium in different organs, or if maybe the, the clotting reflects the different hemodynamics in the different organs, or is it related to different expression of the ACE2 receptor? That's a great question, and I don't know. Uh, I think that the expression of the chart that I showed you where it showed the expression of ACE2 across different tissues was probably not specific to epithelium versus endothelium, just mm -hmm. grinding up the tissue and looking for it. As far as I know, there hasn't been a great effort to quantify differences in ACE2 expression in endothelium. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure of different organs. And I'm not sure how you would actually do it because you'd have to have a functional assay. And, and so I don't, I don't know that that has actually been addressed. Mm -hmm. um, we do know that there is, there are similar amounts of ACE2 expression in endothelium at different sites, but I don't know if functionally they're the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I think um, our time unfortunately has lapsed uh, for this talk. Great talk. Thank you very much. Oh, great. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It was a little bit of a lift for me, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today. Okay, great. So uh, uh, Amy, did you want me to meet with anyone or uh, should we save that for another time? What I I didn't have anyone scheduled, so okay. we'll get okay. back to you. Thank you very okay. much. Be Great. well, everybody. Have Bye. a safe day.